Chapter 2. How to Catch a Thief After many days, like a dog after a rain, the Lady Wilma shook winter from her masts and riggings. She entered the southern latitudes. The sun came out bright and fresh as if newly forged, and the nights were speckled over with stars. The fires went out in the pot-bellied stoves, and the passengers began to shed their greatcoats and heavy woolens. In another week, they were down to their shirt sleeves. In the lower regions of the ship, Praiseworthy and Jack were still at, sh at their shovels. They were powdered over with coal dust, but Jack did not mind the work. It would toughen him up. <laughs> it would toughen him for digging in the gold fields, he thought. Still, the roaring flames had lost their friendliness. The boiler room was becoming distinctly overheated. Master Jack, said Praiseworthy, thinking of the tropic zones that lay ahead. Another week at our post and we shall be roasted alive. But the heat did not bother Jack, for every turn of the paddle wheels brought the far country a bit closer. Even though the sea route was the long way around, it was faster than the overland trail across the plains. The ox-drawn wagon trains were sometimes a year in reaching California, and Jack was in a hurry. Every day counted. It was fine with him that Captain Swain was making a race around the horn. The captain was in a hurry, too. Still, it would be months before the Lady Wilma dropped anchor in San Francisco Bay. There would hardly be time enough to complete the voyage, reach the mines, make a fortune, and returned to Boston before Aunt Arabella had to sell everything. But try they must. This infernal firebox, Praiseworthy said, wiping the sweat from his face. We must think of a plan. We must expose the rogue who light-fingered our passage money. The truth of the matter was that neither Jack nor the butler had the slightest idea how to go about catching a thief. But Praiseworthy was undaunted. They would surely think of something. Meanwhile, they fed the flames, strengthened their backs, toughened their hands, and slept on deck under a balmy sky. In their free time, they washed in buckets of seawater, and Jack began a letter home. He had no idea when or where he would mail it, but Praiseworthy had packed pen and paper and had no intention of allowing Jack to forget his duties. But I would avoid any direct mention of our temporary misfortune, said the butler with a wink. No point in worrying your Aunt Arabella, even for a moment. Finding a shady spot under a lifeboat, Jack spread out his writing materials and began. Dear Aunt Arabella, dear Constance, dear Sarah, by this time, you have found my note on the tea service and learned that Praiseworthy and I have joined the gold rush to California. I am writing this at sea. Please do not worry, as we are well and happy and getting plenty of good exercise. Our ship is the Lady Wilma, and we are racing the Sea Raven to San Francisco. But at the moment, we don't know whether we are ahead or behind, as our ships became separated in the bad weather. But now the sky is as blue as it can get. It is hard to remember that you are still having winter back in Boston. I go barefoot. Praiseworthy says we will soon be seeing the Southern Cross in the sky. I am used to getting used to the food. We have salt beef and sea biscuits, which are very filling. For dessert, we have dandy funk, which is molasses pudding, or plum duff, which is just about what it sounds like. You would be very proud of me, Aunt Arabella, as I eat everything. Praiseworthy wants to be sure to be remembered. We are partners. We intend to come sailing back to Boston in a year. We will be as rich as can be. The ship is very crowded. Everyone is anxious to get to California before the gold is gone. We see other ships on the sea almost every day. They are all California bound. I think it is going to be very crowded in the gold fields. I will tell you about some of our passengers. There's a horse doctor with a wooden leg. There's a judge with a scar over his eye. 
He rolls his own cigars and carries a sword cane. They say the mark over his eye is a dueling scar. We have several soldiers who fought in Mexico. They call themselves Mexico fighters and spend most of their time telling stories about the war. They are high-spirited and always laughing. I meant to mention that we have live animals aboard. They will provide fresh meat during the voyage. We have crates of chickens, a sow, and three pigs, two sheep, and one head of beef. I have made friends with the smallest pig and named him Good Luck for Good Luck. Praiseworthy says pigs are very smart. It seems strange not to be in school, but I am learning things every day. I will leave this letter unfinished and take up my pen again as adventures befall us. The following day, toward dusk, Jack was washing up in a bucket of seawater when Praiseworthy was struck as if by lightning. Master Jack, he exclaimed, you have it. Have what? answered Jack, looking up. He had had good luck with him in the boiler room, and now even the pig was covered with coal dust. Why, the answer. The answer? The answer to what? Praiseworthy's eyebrows shot up with delight. We'll catch the thieving scoundrel at last. You've hit it, Master Jack. You have indeed. Jack couldn't think of what he'd hit, but the next thing he knew, he was following Praiseworthy like a squirrel up one ladder and then another to the pilot house. Captain Swain turned and gave the two intruders a weather-beaten squint. His temper, if not the growl of his voice, had improved with the weather. How is the blasted voyage agreeing with you, my hearties? No complaint, sir, said Praiseworthy. What brings you above decks? And Praiseworthy answered, you may recall that Master Jack and I suffered a slight misfortune at the very onset of this voyage. Some blasted, uh, that is to say, some despicable thief made off with our thumbs. Master Jack here has hit upon a scheme to expose the rascal. Me, said Jack. Bah, the captain interrupted. I don't believe there's any such scamp aboard my ship. I asked the first mate to make a close examination of our passenger list. Gentlemen, they are most of them, and the others are too crude for the clever art of the cut purse. Nevertheless, said Praiseworthy, I believe he's among your passengers, like a fox among sheep. Allow us to prove it. Captain, Squ <laughs> Captain Swain scratched through his dark whiskers. How do you figure on exposing him? We won't expose him, sir. He'll expose himself if you will have all the passengers assembled in the main saloon after dark. We'll know very soon whether or not you have a clever thief aboard. By grab, said the captain thoughtfully. It's worth a try. When the sea turned black, the whale oil lamps were lit in the main saloon and the passengers began to gather. They joked and joshed, glad for something to do, for they were not used to the idleness of life at sea. Jack waited on deck with the black sow from the animal pens. He saw the horse doctor enter on his peg leg, followed by the judge smoking one of his homemade cigars. The ex-soldiers were singing, I'm going to California with a washbowl on my knee. When all the passengers were assembled, the captain made a grand entrance, puffing on a twisted black cigar, and with his long coat flapping almost to his knees. Gentlemen, he said, I'll get to the point. I am told there may be a thief among us, a cut purse. We can't have that now, can we? No, roared out the gold seekers, giving their purses and money belts a reassuring touch. We'll string him up, yelled a big fellow known as Mountain Jim. He had full red eyebrows and wore a bobcat cap. The captain held, a hand, held up a hand to stop the voices. This cut purse has already struck, gentlemen. He lifted the savings of Mr. Praiseworthy and his young partner. You've seen them working off their passage at the coal bunkers. The thief may strike again. Any one of you may be his next victim. He may be standing at your elbow. 
I'll now turn the meeting over to the aforementioned persons who have a plan to capture the scoundrel. Praiseworthy, tall and calm, stepped forward. Thank you, Captain Swain, he said. Our plan is very simple, gentlemen. Master Jack, the sow, if you please. At that signal, Jack led the big black hog to the center of the saloon and tied her to a post. The men began to exchange baffled glances. What had a large sow to do with catching a thief? But if there was a thief among them, they wanted him caught. Their own persons weren't safe with a light-fingered fellow aboard. A pig is a smart animal, Praiseworthy explained. None smarter, yelled out Mountain Jim. Take this old sow, Praiseworthy went on. She's very wise. We've discovered that she can tell a dishonest man by the mere feel of him. She squeals. Gentlemen, you can't even tell a simple lie in her presence. She'll squeal every time. A most remarkable hog, I must say. Jack looked about at the many faces shining under the flickering whale oil lamps. There were the horse doctor and the Mexico fighters and the judge with his sword cane. Not even Mountain Jim, with his fur cap, was above suspicion. Jack fed the black sow a limp carrot to keep her quiet, but he began to feel anxious. What if Praiseworthy was wrong, and the thief wasn't aboard the Lady Wilma at all? I assure you, Praiseworthy was saying, that if the cut purse so much as touches this hog, she will squeal. If you will line up, gentlemen, we'll get on with it. After the lamps are blown out and the saloon is dark, come up to the sow one by one. Touch her with your right index finger. When she squeals, we'll have our thief. I'm for it, one of the ex-soldiers said. Me too. A good plan, said the judge. Suits me, agreed the horse doctor, turning on his peg leg. Some of you boys get the lamps. Let's see how smart this hog is. If you're an honest man, you've got nothing to fear. A moment later, the saloon was in pitch darkness, and Jack held himself very still, feeding carrots to the animal so she wouldn't squeal. One by one, the gold seekers approached and ran a finger along the sow's back. A minute passed. Two. Not a sound from the hog. The passengers scuffed across the deck in their boots, touched the hog, and retired. The men were silent, listening for the squeal that would trap the guilty man. Ten minutes passed, and still they came. Even Praiseworthy felt a bit tense now. When finally the whale oil lamps were relit, the black sow hadn't uttered a, wor uh, huttered, huttered a sound. She stood in the center of the saloon, wondering what all the fuss was about. Captain Swain stepped forward, scratching his beard, as he looked about at his passengers, and then turned to Praiseworthy. Looks like you made a mistake. That cut purse isn't aboard this ship. By grabs, I'm sorry about you and the lad there, but it looks like you'll be shoveling coal all the way around the horn to California. One moment, said Praiseworthy, as unconcerned as you please. It's true, the sow didn't squeal. But the guilty party stands in this room, sir. Gentlemen, Master Jack and I took the liberty of powdering this black sow with coal dust. If each of you will now examine your right index finger where you touched her hide, you will find a smudge. Every man in the saloon instantly turned up his hand, and there indeed was a smudge of black dust. Praiseworthy didn't waste a moment. But one of you... Fearing that the sow's squeal would give you away, one of you approached, but didn't touch a finger to her back. Look around, you gentlemen. If there's a man among you without coal dust on his finger, he has exposed himself as the thief. Almost at once, there was an outcry from one corner of the saloon. We got him! Passengers, suddenly angry, crowded around, and Jack couldn't see who they had pounced upon. We'll string him up. Look there. His finger's clean as a whistle. It's the judge. Judge my eye. He's an imposter. 
Jack burrowed through the crowd in time to see the judge attempt to draw his sword cane. But the Mexico fighters jumped in and pinned his arms back. By the time the ship's officers got hold of the frock-coated imposter, his hat was caved in and the cigar hung in shreds from his mouth. Now the crowd opened up and Jack had never seen Praiseworthy with such a fierce look in his eye. I suppose we'll find the balance of our money in your cabin, sir. Try to find it, spat the thief, peering from Jack to Praiseworthy and back again. Clever you are, but we'll meet again, I warn you, or my name's not Cut Eye Higgins. Humbug, said Praiseworthy just as sharply. The miners had their own ideas of justice, and the suggestions went flying around the saloon. Pitch him overboard and let him swim to California. String him up, put him in irons. But Captain Swain already had his mind made up. Take him to the coal bunkers. By the time we cross the equator, by grabs, he'll think he's in Hades. <laughs>